Hey, we're ready. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Vince. Um, like Vince said, my name is Bill Green with Texas NM Forest Service. We're going to talk about trees today, tonight. Um, the care and management of trees is called arboriculture. So that's what we're going to look at. I'm part of the Texas NM Forest Service Community Forestry Program. So I'm the South Texas Community Forester. Um, I think you can see my cursor on the screen here. Just to know that for during the presentation. Okay. Yep. So we cover the whole state. Um, and I'm my office is in Kingsville, but work in the coastal bend and the Rio Grande Valley. Um, so we're gonna talk about trees. What we're gonna cover is um, how to prune trees, how to try to be careful and just that working with trees is dangerous. We talk some about how to plant trees and then how to take care of them after you planted them. And then uh, ways that trees are good for our health. There's a national program called uh, Healthy Trees, Healthy Lives. Then after that, uh, there's, there's some uh, extra slides that we'll look at, go over if uh, time allows. And I think, uh, yeah, I'll check with Vince and all of you around the middle someplace if you want to take a break. Um, so hopefully things go good. Um, okay. Yeah, I had it going automatic, I'll do it manually here. So we'll start with tree pruning. And uh, so at the end of this, I should have an idea how to correctly prune trees. There's just a lot of practices, even by professional tree workers that aren't correct. So try to get some ideas across of how to correctly prune your trees or have somebody do it. Okay, yeah, I think, I'm not sure how I'm gonna turn off that automatic progression. So I guess I'll just keep flipping back and forth. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so yeah, pruning, uh, one, one general rule is if you have a lot to prune for some good reason, um, you shouldn't prune more than 25% of a tree at any one time. So if you had a good reason to prune more than a quarter of the tree or the crown or the leaf area, uh, you should spread that out, out over a couple of years. And the, like I just sort of mentioned, if you have a good reason, uh, it's, it's not like some people think that pruning is good for the tree or invigorates the tree or stimulates growth. Pruning is damaging the tree. So you prune only if you have a good reason. And we'll start with a video and then go over all the points in the video. So hopefully this plays well for you. And this is from a coworker of mine with Texas NM Forest Service, Carrie Hines. She made the video, a well done video, and we'll use this as a base, all the points that she presents during the video. Uh, we'll talk about in our presentation tonight. So here goes. Hi, my name is Carrie Hines and I'm with the Texas A&M Forest Service as a program coordinator. We're here today to look at pruning young trees. Before you start pruning, it's important that you have the right tools. Some of these things might include uh, your classic garden shears. You might use loppers. For loppers, you really don't want to be trying to do anything more than about thumb size. For over that size, one of the tools that you can use are hand saws. So we have our classic hand saw, and we also have a folding hand saw that's more compact. You'll see more professionals with these. And for really tall lim limbs, if you're feeling adventurous, you can use a pole saw. I also have my hard hat here and I have some uh, tree wound spray if I cut on an oak, which this is, in order to seal the wound to decrease the chance that it gets oak wilt. All right, so let's take a closer look at this tree. Always have a purpose in mind before you start making cuts on the tree. 
we're going to use white ribbon today to mark the lines that we want to come off. That way we can take a step back and look at what it's going to do to the overall form of the tree. Small cuts make less damage than larger cuts. So if you can prune a tree while it's still young, and ideally when branches are under two inches in diameter, that will be the best for the tree over time. This tree is about six to seven years old. It was pruned two years ago to remove the lowest branches down around the bottom of the tree. You can see the old wounds right here and here. Today, we're going to continue to take off some of these lowest branches or crown raising as it's called to give us clearance underneath the tree. It's important to make a proper type of cut. That way the tree can seal itself off as it continues growing. To do that, you need to find two things. The first being the branch bark ridge, which this one has a really nice ridge right here. This is where the limb started growing out of the tree itself. And you can see uh, some of the bark in between the limb and, and, and the trunk of the tree. You also want to find the branch collar. This is the slight swelling that occurs right where the limb starts growing out of the tree. If you cut just outside of the branch collar, the tree over time will grow over that wound and seal itself off. Since this limb is over an inch in size and is actually kind of heavy, we're going to use a handsaw to use the three cut method to protect the remaining tree uh, when we cut the branch off. The three cut method first uses a small undercut a little away from where we wanna make our finished cut to go slightly into the tree. We'll come around and we'll cut all the way through the branch. If there is any tearing on the underside, it will stop where we made the first cut through. Once the entire limb is gone, I'll come back and I'll make the cut where we had the string earlier. If you have a limb that's sorry. Yeah, okay, so I can't, uh, I don't know why it skipped on it, but the whole thing is going automatic. But um, yeah, all the different points. And then right where she was just talking, uh, she painted that wound. We'll get to that, that you only paint oak tree wounds. It used to be paint all wounds with pruning. Now it's better that the tree seals itself on its own without paint. So it's no longer paint wounds unless it's an oak tree. And that's only if you're in an oak wilt area and we don't have oak wilt in the coastal bend. It's getting close though. So we'll keep you updated on that. Um, and then, yeah, so we'll go right to all the rest of uh, my presentation goes over the other points because I can't get back to where the video left off, but that's okay. Okay, so she mentioned, Carrie mentioned uh, pruning young trees. Uh, that's called structural pruning. You want to get the shape, look at what shape you want the tree to take according to its nat natural growing, uh, the way it should look, or what you want to help it look like, not making it uh, too abnormal, though. So, yeah, structural pruning is the pruning of young trees in order to develop a tree with a strong structure and desirable form. And it's easier and cheaper to prune young trees as small trees as compared to older trees are the, they can take that, that pruning and seal over the wounds much easier and faster than old mature trees. And we'll also talk about it with, with smaller branches are better to prune when you get to larger branches harder for the tree to seal over those. Um, and remember that you only prune if you have a good reason. So before pruning, you should take a walk around the tree, see what you want to, and maybe mark with uh, tape the way Carrie did, 
or at least have a good picture in your mind of what you're going to be doing before you just get started uh, pruning off branches. So you determine which branches should be pruned for proper structure, and then you prune branches. Again, only if you have a good reason, like there's, there's, you want to raise the crown like Carrie mentioned, or you have uh, branches over a structure or something that there's risk involved. And then uh, you always would get rid of dead branches and you always would get rid of rubbing branches, or one of the two rubbing branches. Here I mentioned the, the pruning tools. So there's um, a lot of tools available, but the basic ones are the regular garden pruning shears for branches that are less than a half inch in diameter or so. And then the lopping shears with handles long enough to add extra leverage for branches that are a bit bigger um, or just barely over an inch, you can still do with loppers. And then there's also various types of pruning saws for branches that are over an inch, like the, the saw that Kerry used or the folding saw in the, in the photo here. Um, and then if you get up to things above, than it would be with the pole saw. Um, I'm not gonna get into uh, using a chainsaw. Um, if you are using chainsaw, just, I mean, it's a whole another level of, of uh, being really careful. Um, okay, in the video that Carrie was presenting, um, it's recommended to try to prune trees when they're young. Like I said, they, they re respond to the pruning better than older trees. Also that branches that are two inches or less are easier, but at least uh, four inches or less are a lot better for, easier for the tree to seal over. Um, sorry about that skipping, it's doing it automatically, but I'll try to control it. Um, so, yeah, four inches and less. If you're getting to branches that are over four inches, it's gonna be harder for the tree to seal those over. It might uh, open it up to more decay. Sometimes you have to do it if you have a good reason. Um, okay. Um, yeah, if you get into larger branches, also probably a good idea to bring in a certified arborist to look at what's going on. Okay, a lot of times people are asking, when should I prune? Um, we'll go over the best times as in the chart here, but I had a professor in forestry school that said, I mean, if you got a good reason, you prune whenever you have to. Basically, he said you prune when your tools are sharp. So if you have to prune, you do it. But the best time is, is when the, the trees have stored a lot of energy from the photosynthesis, the carbohydrates in the branches, and they're, they're ready for the dormant period of the winter. And that's the best time for the tree to prune. So during period five is in the chart, uh, the winter or the dormant season. Um, and as well as uh, period one, like the late winter, when the, before the leafing out starts. Okay, this is when removing some of the stored energy will have uh, less effect. Uh, on, on the tree's health. So you should be aware that the percentage of live crown removed by the pruning should not be more than the 25% that I mentioned at the beginning. If you have to do that, then you should spread it out over a few years. Um, and like I mentioned, the impact on the tree's health also depends on the tree's age. The younger, the easier it is on the tree. So avoid pruning during the period two on the chart, during the spring, when the leaf expansion, the leafing out has taken place and, and the flowering is gonna start. Um, this is a time when the stored energy is at its lowest, it's being used and the pruning will take away some of that, those carbohydrates, the sugars that have been stored for growth and for uh, the energy needed. Um, so removing leaves and, well, cutting off branches removes leaves and that's taking away photosynthesis ability because you're getting rid of leaves. So then that's how the tree 
produces its energy. So, um, yeah, so getting back, I have to flip back. Okay, so it, the period fall, four in the fall is also a time uh, just prior to leaf drop to avoid pruning because uh, the tree needs to be storing that energy uh, as it goes into the winter. And then during the winter, that period five and one is when you should do the pruning. Uh, pruning in period three during the summer is okay, but it's more stressful on the trees in the South Texas heat that we have. But if you have to, like I said, you can prune anytime you need to if you have a good reason. And I did mention that we'll talk a little bit about tree work. And if, if you're gonna be doing uh, your own work at your home, just be aware that, that you know, tree work is dangerous. It's a dangerous profession for those professionals and even more if you're doing it on your own at your home, probably should consult a certified arborist. Um, and then if you are doing work on your own, at least have somebody out there with you and not doing it alone. Okay, and take a look around. There's, there's no cables nearby that have uh, electricity. So you know, a lot of things to consider and, and uh, it's a dangerous, dangerous job. So the, the big areas uh, in the pie, um, the biggest sections. So you have the where it's struck by a tree, uh, electrocutions, uh, struck by a branch, and 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 falls from when someone was in the tree, and that's where the most uh, accidents occur with uh, working with trees. So be careful. And then there's a. Uh, Tree Care Industry Association, that's all the information's available online. You can check that. Um, it's uh, tcia.org and that's Tree Care Industry Association and just some examples I have on the screen with uh, the way some of the accidents occurred. Um, the idea is that working with trees is dangerous. Okay, so if you're to be working with trees, uh, if you're not using chainsaw, at least have some good gloves and boots on. Um, if you're working with branches above your head, then a hard hat would be a good idea. And then something for your eye protection. But if you're using chainsaw, then you get into chaps and all the other equipment. So the idea is be careful. I already mentioned in the video where Carrie was spraying with paint um, the wound. You don't need to paint tree wounds. Act, well, actually in South Texas, in, in the Coastal Bend or, or the Rio Grande Valley, because we don't have oak growth. The only wounds that are painted now compared to years ago when tar or paint was put on all pruning wounds, the tree re recovers better, seals over better if you don't paint. It's not like the paint does a really bad, uh, hurts the tree a lot. So if for some reason, because of the, the look of the wound, you want to paint, you can, but you don't need to. But if it is in an oak wilt area, then you should paint oak tree wounds. Okay, um, so I mentioned oak wilt, I'm not sure if you, heard of that disease, but it's it's uh, real bad. And in central Texas, Hill Country, San Antonio, north of there, um, it's getting closer to the coastal bend. So we'll keep an eye on it um, as it, it could move into the area. But it's uh, killing oak trees and it's very infectious and it's caused by a fungus. Um, all oak trees can be affected by oak wilt white oaks less so than red oaks. Live oaks are sort of in the middle, but uh, all oaks can be infected. So if you live in a 
if you believe that a oak tree is infected with oak, well, you should contact me or a certified arborist and we can do the testing because it's not in this area, but if it does appear, we want to know about it. So I would be uh, looking to test those trees and see if it is oak wilt. Um, there is a website yeah, I have on the screen with texasoakwilt.org. Um, there's a lot of information, videos explaining oak wilt. Again, we don't have it in the coastal bend, but it's getting close. Okay, I keep mentioning sealing over, the tree seals over. Trees don't heal, they, they seal. Um, the difference is like animals, we, we replace tissue with a wound and the trees don't do that. They make a compartment all on all sides, above, below, inside, outside. They compartmentalize the wound. And you see that callus forming on the outside. And then there's other types of walls that are formed on the inside of the tree to, so that any decay doesn't spread further into the tree. I mentioned with larger branches, the tree might not be able to seal over a wound. And that's on the outside that we can see and also on the inside. Larger branches are hard, more decay probable could get into the center of the tree that the tree wouldn't be able to seal with all those walls, the compartmentalization wouldn't be able to do it in all cases. So the tree natural process is to seal with, uh, it's called compartmentalization of decay in trees. So that's called coat it is just the agriculture term. And that was discovered or presented from research by Alex Shigo, who's a famous arboriculturist. Um, so the trees seal all wounds. They don't replace the tissue like we do with healing. So that's why it's called the trees don't heal, they seal. Um, so yeah, that, uh, Dr. Alex Shigo is called the father of, of modern day arboriculture and uh, did a lot of important research also on, on uh, we'll get to with Carrie in the video mentioned pruning just outside where the red line is here, just outside of the branch collar, the swelling. It used to be cutting flush to the trunk and the tree will seal over a lot better if you leave that branch collar and it's able to do that compartmentalization a lot better if you leave the branch pallet. So you see that swelling here and you would cut just outside and you do your previous one cut, two cut, and then the third cut right here. Okay, I keep mentioning you only prune if you have a good reason, and those reasons would include either safety, health, or aesthetics. Um, and again, I'll mention that you don't prune more than 25% of the tree's crown at any one time. Um, and I already talked about just that it's, it's not that pruning is good for the tree, you only prune if you have a good reason. It's stress on the tree but there are reasons and it's worth it. And, or if you wanna establish that structure for walking underneath or as the tree grows and younger trees, you can do a lot more structural pruning. Um, so yeah, we'll go over the safety, the reasons as far as safety, health and aesthetics. Okay, so if you're pruning for safety, it's pruning branches that are rubbing or crossing each other um, just to, cause that could open up through the bark and, and let decay into the branches and into the trunk of the tree. Um, another safety hazard is with dead branches. So you prune off dead branches um, or broken or dead branches. And pruning for safety also involves removing branches that could fall or cause injury to people or buildings or property. Another safety concern is when branches uh, obstruct your line of sight, 
for vehicles. And so then pruning would be indicated that's a good reason. So the branches uh, should be trimmed back, cut off and have the canopy raised if, if that's the reason that you're going for, for safety or for aesthetics. Um, one thing I want to mention, even tree workers that you hire and come into your home or yard, they're not supposed to be pruning any branches that are within 10 feet of a power line. Um, that would be with AEP or one of their contractors that are line certified, they call it. So the professionals should not be pruning branches within 10 feet of power lines. Uh, pruning for tree health. Uh, sometimes the trees, like uh, I got a problem with uh, disease or infestation, fungal infection, or there's branch die back, and the tree can sometimes be saved by pruning away the infected areas. So that would be another good reason. There's no wrong time or season for this type of pruning. Like my professor said, I mentioned earlier, you prune when your tools are sharp. So using the proper tool for the proper job. Then there's also pruning for aesthetics. Um, the look of the tree can be improved or enhanced sometimes just with uh, taking a walk around and seeing what branches would help uh, get to the the view of the tree or the structure of the tree that you want. So yeah, be cautious though, have a well, have a good idea, walk around the tree and get an idea what you're doing so you don't just start chopping, <clears throat> chopping off branches. Okay, which branches should be removed? As already mentioned, um, it's important to walk all the way around the tree, get a view of the tree, determine which branches should be pruned for the structure you're looking for. Uh, sometimes people like to use tapes or ribbons like uh, in the video we saw to mark and keep track of what branches you're gonna be pruning. Again, not more than 25, 25% of the tree or the crown. Okay. Um, so I already said uh, you get rid of dead and decaying branches. They're high priority to remove. And next, we want to get rid of the rubbing branches, crossing branches, as in the middle slide here so that they don't grow. You want to remove those rubbing branches before this occurs where they're growing together. So that should be done, done when the branches were a lot smaller. Even you can see branches that are going to be rubbing in a year or so and get rid of one of them beforehand. And then you also want to prune <coughs> that are tight, like a V shape isn't as strong as like a U shape. So a U shape is a stronger branch union or, and not this type V, those can split a lot easier. <coughs> Excuse me. And then <coughs> fourth in the order of what branches to prune and be removed is uh, uh, when there's water sprouts. Um, you can see different examples of water sprouts on branches or from the trunk. And if there are a lot of water sprouts, you shouldn't remove them all at once. If <clears throat> the tree doesn't have a, enough uh, leaf area to be producing, like after a big damage, you could be those water sprouts are the only photosynthesis that's going on. And then you would, not try to clean off all of the sprouts. You'd leave just a main, a main, main branch, branches that are going to develop into principal branches.
Okay, pruning small branches, like I said, four inches or less presents less stress to a tree as compared to pruning large branches. So four inches or less is a good, uh, if you're gonna get over to four inches, just be aware that it's gonna be harder for the tree to deal with that and seal over those wounds. So if you can do it <clears throat> when the tree's younger and the branches are smaller, that's better. In the video at the beginning, Carrie mentioned crown raising for visibility. Might be for visibility, walking underneath, or, or for different reasons. Um, but crown raising just elevates the, the height of the crown. So if it's for walking underneath or vehicles passing underneath or just walking underneath to cut the lawn or any of those reasons, that's a good reason to prune and raise the crown. Um, removing those lower branches is important in the pruning process, but does require some knowledge of the tree's growth. And you wouldn't want to do it when you're, if the tree's too, you want to wait till it grows high enough so that you can raise the crown. So yeah, the important point in crown raising is that you do not remove too many of the lower branches in any single year. So as you stand back, look around, walk around, look at the tree and decide what trees you, or what branches you would remove. And you also wanna look at what you would look, call the live crown ratio. So you wanna leave, um, this is, You want to leave 60% of the crown. You don't want to take and just have less than half of the crown. So you wouldn't prune up here. You want to leave so you have 60% and 40%, at least 40%. So if you want to raise the crown more than that, you might have to wait till it, the tree grows uh, taller. So you're always leaving 60% of the live crown ratio or that from the height. And yeah, I'm not looking at the chat, uh, Vince or anybody. So jump in if there's any questions. Oh yeah, I can see the chat here. <clears throat> That's back to the oak wilt, the fungus brought in by birds. Okay, <clears throat> first, yeah, you should look at that website, texasoakwilt.org um, for a lot of information, but basically, the, the worst uh, with the oak trees, it's only in oak trees, it's oak wilt. The fungus grows on red oaks underneath the bark in like what you call a fungal mat. And then there's some insects that can get into that because it's a sweet smelling and, and insects get in and eat that. And those insects, if they, they're carrying fungus, enough fungus from that fungal mat on red oaks, can infect a white oak or a live oak on a fresh cut wounds. If you have an infected oak and it's pruned, the insects aren't gonna get enough of the fungus from that to infect new trees. So it's mostly pruning wounds that are open and fresh will attract insects. And if those have been feeding on the fungus on the red oaks on those fungal mats under the bark, that's where you could infect and spread it to new areas. <clears throat> so it's, yeah, it's a bit to understand, complicated, but so that's why if you're pruning oak trees in an oak wilt area, you just paint all wounds. And it can be carried by insects, not birds. Um, preventing fire from electric lines. So the, the part about not, pruning any branches within 10 feet of electric lines is for safety to not get electrocuted. All right. Yeah. Um, we live in Ohio, Hill Country, bunch of oaks dying, very little wet red oaks. Well, red oaks are more susceptible to oak wilt 
But like I said, any oak can be infected. And the oak wilt is severe. If the tree is infected, you can prune away those branches and you can do treatments with fungicide injected into the trunk. Uh, it's not cheap, but you can do it. And you can try to save a tree, but uh, branches that are infected have to be pruned away that you can't bring those back. Um, so red oaks, if you haven't seen many red oaks infected, that's just by luck. Red oaks are more susceptible to oak. Okay, yeah, and so once in a while, I try to check the chat. So yeah, for correct pruning, we mentioned the leaf area, the crown, not removing more than 25%. Also mentioned that that live crown ratio from like the height. So the leaf area is the total leaf area. If you looked at it like a pie, you don't want to take more than 25% of the pie. So this would be from this tree, pruning this area would be removing less than 25%, that's good. You wouldn't want to remove so much that it's more than a quarter or 25% of that crown area, the leaf area. And then with the live crown ratio, it's with the vertical part. So you don't want to leave less than 60% of crown area. If you're trying to raise the crown like in the video or if you're just walking underneath or for other reasons. Oh, and I'll just mention also that um, I sent up PDF, like a document version of this PowerPoint to Vince and some other handouts. So I guess those will go to you in emails. In the video at the beginning, Carrie mentioned or used the three cut method. It's just to avoid uh, from running down, splitting bark, pulling off as the branch is cut and could strip bark. And that would be a lot of damage to the tree as in the photo here on the right. <laughs> so it's a three cut method out from the branch collar is where your final cut's gonna be. And here, that's the final cut. So you make one undercut, cut off most of the weight of the branch. Now you got a short stub and you can make one cut without a lot of weight and you won't split the, or rip or strip the bark. Yeah, I'm sorry, it keeps the automatic timing. I can't shut that off for some reason. So that's why the slides keep jumping ahead and I go back. Um, yeah, just going over again, the three cut method <clears throat> underneath, above, and then the final cut. You don't want to leave a stub and you don't want to leave a jagged cut. So it's the one cut, second cut, and then the third cut is outside that swelling, outside the swelling where the tree will seal over that wound. And remember with that coat, it, the compartmentalization is also sealing over the wound inside, outside, above, below, so that there's not decay going, hopefully not decay going into the trunk of the tree. It used to be uh, flush cuts, like I mentioned, and that, that opens up more wound area and outside the swelling of the branch collar is where the tree can produce that callus more easily and seal over the wound. So yeah, I already sort of covered the, the tools, pruning shears for smaller, and if you're working with young trees, small branches, that's a lot easier. It's easier on you, it's easier on the tree. If they're smaller than like a half inch and you can just make with uh, pruning shears. Then loppers for a bit, a bit larger branches. And if you have to, it would be with a saw and that's where you would use the three cut method.
Uh, when you have a small, like you see in this photo, these two photos actually, um, those, those, they're called codanamin stems. You can just by looking at them, you can see that one of those are in a storm, in a windstorm, those could split off and with a, a house nearby, I mean, there could be a lot of damage. So when the tree's small is when you should have got rid of one of those trunks one of these trunks, so it's just one main trunk and not having these two trunks with this included bark, it's called, and those in windstorms can break off. And again, just you do it when the, when the trees are a lot smaller, younger, and then you avoid this problem. Now to make these cuts, you're gonna have a lot larger than that four inch general rule, you want to prune branches that are less than four inches. But now you would have to, because of the damage or risk to the house, get rid of large cuts and that's going to be more stress on the tree and more danger risk that decay will go into the tree. Yeah, so the, the U-shaped Branch unions are a lot stronger than like with that included bark and V-shaped unions. So on a trunk though, you would wanna have one main trunk. So yeah, I keep mentioning we don't prune without a good reason. So yeah, pruning is not indicated for all trees. You don't have to do pruning. It's only if you have a good reason. Um, some trees require repeated pruning just because of structures nearby or the way they're growing. And it might be that you should consult the certified arborist. Um, if a young tree is properly pruned when it's young and you establish the proper structure, then there's a lot better chance it won't need pruning or much pruning as it's uh, growing older and mature. So yeah, you plant a tree, uh, pruning should start a year or two after to get that proper structure if it needs it and you have a good reason. And another thing is it just costs a lot less to do pruning on small young trees than it, when they're large. So look at the trees when they're young and see what that structure should look like or have an arborist come in and do it when they're small and young and easy to work on. Okay, a couple, um, like with crepe myrtles, well, we'll go over that specifically, but I mean, just topping, cutting off the, the main leader of a tree, uh, tree topping is just uh, really stressful on the tree, uh, throws it into confusion, sprouting all over, you're gonna have a mess of sprouts coming out all over on the tree. So you don't do tree topping. Um, it's, yeah, it's not a good idea or option at any time. Um, if it's, uh, cause it's underneath power lines or cables and it just is the wrong tree in the wrong place. Um, so yeah, cause it confuses the tree, causes abnormal reactions, um, a lot of sprouting and then you're gonna have a lot of work or pay for a lot of work to be done and all that sprouting after you confuse it and starts trying to recover from topping. So you're gonna have a lot of extra costs. And then the, the branch runes where, you, where a tree is topped are slow to seal and makes it more susceptible to decay getting in and fungus. And it's just, not looking good. I mean, it's uh, yeah. Top don't don't allow anyone to be topping your trees. Um, there is uh, there after a storm with broken branches, it could be that the main trunk is broken. You have to do the topping as part of a tree restoration. That would be a special case. I'll mention at the end. Uh, 
there are some resources available to look at for how you would manage the tree restoration if you have to top a tree because of damage during a storm or something. Uh, another time when on, on not topping the tree, not topping the tree, but you might have some branches growing off to the side and for a structure or for where you want the, the branches to grow, you wanna get rid of like a principal branch. So you can establish a new principal, but it's called a reduction cut. So you would, where there is another branch that can take over as the leader, here is the leader in the photo. But for some reason you need to get rid of that branch. So you would cut where there's another branch that can take over as the leader. And that's called a reduction cut. So you're not, you're not just cutting and leaving a stub. You're, you've got an idea where the branch is gonna to continue to grow. It's just for some reason there was that these other branches were causing a problem and needed to be removed. So a reduction cut is another um, type of pruning that you can consider. Yeah, like with topping, for some reason with crepe myrtles, people think that it is needed for the tree to flower stronger and that's not true. Um, and some people call it crepe murder. Um, so it's really no reason to do it. You can have a nice looking tree with crepe myrtles. Multi-trunk, there are some single trunk crepe myrtles also or multi-trunk, but you don't get all this mess of sprouts from, from topping the crepe myrtles. So yeah, try to not live with neighbors, friends, that they don't continue this crepe, crepe murder. Another common practice, if you see these trees in the photos, it's called lion's tailing just because the tree workers have removed all the branches in the lower areas and just left these balls like out at the end of a lion's tail. And that causes a lot of stress to the tree. You'll get a lot of sprouting in here with the reaction, the reaction of it being over pruned. And a lot of tree, some tree workers are doing this just because I think it's, it's like in style. Others have talked to me and said, well, we do that so that the wind and the storm can pass through and not break off the branches. And that's just totally false. I mean, the wind grabs those, the balls of branches or leaves at the end and whips those around and you have more branches breaking in a windstorm than if you left those intermediate leaves and smaller branches. So you don't have anyone come in and remove all these intermediate branches and clean it off. Other workers I've seen where they do it just because they can reach those better and they can charge you more money because they show you all the branches that they pruned. Um, but this is not a good pruning practice. And like I said, in windstorms, then you'll get more of those trees blown over or branches broken off. Okay, when you're doing pruning, you do that third cut to have a clean cut, not leaving a stub or a jagged wound. If you leave the stubs, you can get all this decay going in. So you want that cut outside the branch color, should have been cut off the stub so it can seal over with the callus, not leaving these stubs. And just to mention again, that term with coated, the compartmentalization of decay or disease in trees is coated. And that's where if you cut it just outside the branch collar, the tree will seal over with the callus a lot more easily. In the old days, there was more 
cutting through that branch collar, flush cuts to the branch or trunk, and that opens up more and that branch collar is where it produces the callus. The tree produces uh, the callus more easily to seal over those wounds. So it's no longer, uh, the flush cuts are no longer practiced. It should be outside of that branch collar. So if you have to prune larger diameter, like over four inches, then, then the tree's sealing response or the coat it is more difficult, more challenging for the tree. Uh, the large diameter wounds um, would not only take longer to seal over, they may not be able to seal over. So you also have to be careful when pruning larger branches not to rip or tear bark as the branch comes down, you would still use the three cut method with larger branches, but that should be done by a professional. Okay, with uh, mature trees with larger branches, it's important to minimize the, the hazards with branch uh, failure if you're trying to prune larger branches. So this can open up the tree to a lot of disease, can hurt the tree, removing large branches, a lot of leaf area. And it's, you wanna prune if you can when the, the trees are younger. Um, yeah, live branch removal or pruning, is less desirable on mature trees, but it's sometimes necessary. And if you have broken or, or cracked or diseased branches, you have to remove those even if they are larger on, on mature trees. Um, in some cases, it might just be too late to make any meaning, meaningful structural changes to an already mature tree. And with older trees, it, it may be most indicated to only remove the dead and diseased branches and, and unless there's a high risk for some reason, leave the other branches. So yeah, only if it's really essential do you remove uh, larger branches. But again, you would always remove dead branches or diseased branches. Um, Yeah, just the importance of trying to do the pruning when the trees, the branches are smaller, the trees are younger. So yeah, less pruning is almost always better unless there's really good reasons and it's better for the tree's health. So yeah, don't let a tree service uh, try to make you feel like you're getting your money's worth just by removing a lot of branches. You only remove what should be or needs to be removed. And just remember that the leaves, the green leaves are the factories that make the food from the photosynthesis, the carbohydrates. That's where the food production comes for the, the tree. And all those carbohydrates are stored and used for growth. Okay, um, yeah, let's see. Certified arborists, there's the International Society of Arboriculture, there's certified arborists, there's a few that are in Corpus Christi area and some in the valley and more in San Antonio and the hill country if you also live or have homes over in that area. Um, yeah, there's a website for International Society of Arboriculture and certified arborists have proven that they know how to work properly with trees and safely. Okay, I'm not sure um, anyone wants to jump in. Do we want to keep going uh, or take a break? Any other questions here in the chat? What do you want to do, keep going or take a break?
Keep going, Bill. Yeah, Vince, do you know where I would get this automatic progression stopped? I've never had it before in my PowerPoints and this. I don't know why it's doing that to you. Um, yeah, because I've used this presentation and it have, but I can deal with it. It's just a little annoying for everybody. Keep flashing backwards and on slides. So sorry about that. Do you do you have it uh, embedded in there to advance automatically? Well, I didn't think so. I've used this presentation before, and you know, I made a few changes. I must have clicked on something that that um, advanced it. Yeah. But I can't figure it out right now, so I'll just yeah, keep on the transition. Uh, just to let you know, uh, even when I reduce the file, I can't upload it to to our VMS. It's too big. And if you could send me the the PowerPoint, I could break it apart into two parts and then reduce it, and I should be able to upload it. Uh, as I can, I can send you the PDF in, in two halves. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you sent me the PDF, but I can't break the PDF apart. Right, it's I can do that. I can break the PDF apart and send you two PDFs. Yeah, if you would, and then I can reduce it. It'll, it'll only accept files under five megs. All right, well, maybe I'll do it into three parts then. But I'll send that to you. All righty. <coughs> okay, so we'll keep going and uh, no questions or put them in the chat and look at them later, anything with the pruning. Um, and now we'll go on to planting trees. There's a few common mistakes I uh, wanna cover and and also, I'm not looking all the time at the chat. So if you want to someone break in with their microphone or let me know that there's questions. OK, so how to plant trees. With our, I mean, it's a lot different down here in Texas, South Texas, especially, but all of Texas compared to up north for the planting season. Uh, just during our hot summers, it's too much stress on the trees. So we wanna plant between Halloween and St. Patrick's Day and not getting too close to St. Patrick's Day. So you should be planting at least in February better if it's November or December. Um, one of the main problems with planting small trees from containers is digging the hole taking the tree out of the container, the hole's a bit too deep and the branch collar or the trunk collar would be below ground. So when you dig the hole, you, a lot of times people would dig real deep and say, well, I'll loosen up that soil so the roots can grow into it easier. But what happens is the, the container, the root ball sinks down because the what you filled in with soil from digging too deep and then filled in settles and that branch collar. It's real important that this trunk collar is at ground level, not covered by soil because the hole was too deep. That will seriously affect the growth and the health of the tree. And it might take 10, 15 years but the tree would die or, or show very poor growth. Um, so the, the trunk collar, the trunk flare, when you're in looking at a container, planting a small tree, sometimes even in the container, the, the nursery's got it too deep. So you wanna see where that trunk flare is and have that at ground level. Only dig the hole as deep as that root ball, not deeper. You can dig it wider, but not deeper so that it doesn't settle down. If you do dig it too deep, you can just measure with your shovel too to get an idea so you don't dig it too deep, but 
if you do dig it too deep and you fill in, uh, stamp down that soil that you had to refill in um, very uh, strongly so that you don't get that settling in that trunk flare would settle down and be below ground level. Um, also with the uh, tree planting is you, you, it isn't, you're trying to do a good job and so you have uh, some special soil, uh, improved soil, potting soil. Don't use that for planting the trees. You're only gonna fill in a small area and the roots have to go out into the area that they're gonna be growing in. You're not gonna improve the soil on your whole yard and that's where the roots are gonna be growing. So you only backfill with the soil that you dug out. Don't put in improved soil or potting soil. So a lot of people think that the um, the roots on trees grow really deep, um, like a mirror image in this photo here. This is not the way the roots grow. The roots are not very deep, only like a couple of feet deep, going out really wide, even wider than the drip line or the crown area. So when you're doing sidewalks, uh, irrigation systems, um, doing trenching of any kind, you can seriously uh, affect a lot of the root system. And so at least you would not wanna to try to do it on two or three sides of the, the tree. It's gonna cut off a lot of the tree's roots because they aren't that deep. And, um, just going over a bit of the different kinds of roots. There's absorption roots, um, where most of the water and nutrients are taken up. Those are out where there's active growth going on. Then there's the larger woody roots where a lot of the storage of chirohydrates, the sugars produced from the photosynthesis are stored also in branches and the trunk but in the woody areas of the tree. But that includes woody uh, lateral roots. There's a few anchor roots that go a little bit deeper than that, only a couple of feet deep uh, that I was mentioning before. But the, the, the thing is, there's not, on most trees, the tap root stops growing and you have a few anchor roots and you don't have that huge tap root like people think, like growing down to China, so. And just taking care of the root system when you're planting trees uh, from containers, if you see, uh, one thing, if you're in a nursery and you wanna get your money's worth and you pick the biggest tree and it's in a small container, you probably have a lot of problem with uh, the roots circling around. Um, you want roots that are flexible and small enough that you can loosen them up and spread them out and not have where these roots are circling and it's going to strangle, the tree will strangle itself as those tree, the roots uh, increase in diameter. So a lot of times a smaller tree is better tree to get a, a small tree in a bigger container, but not just going, might be the, not the best idea to go for the biggest tree because you got problems with the roots. If you do have a tree, you get a container and you open, you get it out of the container, you gotta do some serious pruning on these roots. It's better to do some heavy duty pruning, heavy duty pruning to loosen up those roots and, and prune off where they were circling around. So you don't, you'd have to cut these roots off, even though it's major stress on the root system, but it's better than leaving them to circle and girdle themselves and strangle themselves. So you do some serious, loosen up the roots, prune off the edge. Don't just uh, take it out of the container and, and put it in the ground. Do some, you wanna be gentle with the tree, but with the roots, you wanna 
tease things up a bit and and loosen those roots up. And if they're not able to be uh, headed out straight from like radials from the trunk, then you would prune those up. Another thing that a lot of times people think is um, that you always have to stake a tree after you plant it. If you plant the tree and the root ball is a good size for the size of the tree, the diameter of the tree, there's enough root ball and you plant it correctly, it probably doesn't need to be staked at all. But if you do stake a tree and cable it, you want to do it with loose cables, not real taut so that in the wind, the tree does move some and, and puts on more girth on that diameter of, of its trunk. So you don't have it tightly cabled. And then you remove the cabling, the staking, as soon as it's able to stand on its own so that you don't get, you've all seen this where it's just a shame for the tree that the, the, the the cabling was too tight around the trunk and, and causes damage as the tree increases in diameter. So only stake if you need to stake. One thing that's really good for the trees is keeping that grass Grass and trees don't get along. Um, mostly if you're watering enough to keep your grass green, it's probably too much for the trees. So if you have a, a mulch circle around the tree, that will help. Um, and you don't, when you're irrigating, you don't wanna be squirting the trunk of the tree. You wanna water out where the root ball is. But the mulch will help a lot keeping lawnmowers and that away from scraping the trunk and also just the decomposition of the mulch and, and keeping the soil cooler and holding in moisture. Every, the mulch is uh, real good for the trees. So if you have those mulch circles around your trees, um, there's a lot of benefits to that. Oh, one thing though, um, you don't want to put on a really deep amount like two inches of mulch even less than the four inches is in the slide like two or three inches of mulch is plenty and you keep it away from you don't mulch right at the trunk like four or five inches around the trunk no mulch and then the the two or three inches of mulch but not piling up this volcano mulching not piling up on the trunk no no mulch should be at the the flare of the trunk and only two or three inches deep and not a pile of mulch going up because you'll get rot and decay on the trunk if you have that mulch with all the moisture that's going to hold in there and decay the trunk, the bark. Okay, uh, a rule you can use for watering young trees, five gallons maybe in the summer, Two, you could do two gallons per inch of diameter during the planting season um, in October, November, December, January. Two to three gallons of water for the each inch of diameter uh, during the summer, maybe four or five gallons per inch of diameter. And overwatering can be as bad as not watering enough. So we'll go over a bit of a watering plan here um, for young, just newly planted uh, trees. And I meant you're not, when you're watering with the hose, not squirting, not watering the trunk, you water out at the, the root ball area where those absorption roots are, not spraying the trunk that can cause the bark to decay. So uh, a friend in San Antonio, Mark Peterson has uh, what he calls the one, two, three, three, two, one. So for watering, 
uh, for newly planted trees. So the first month you water three times a week, every other day. If it rains, that counts as one of your water. You don't have to water that day if it rained. So the first month, water three times a week or every other day, not every day. And it's that two to four gallons of water uh, per inch of diameter. The second month, two times a week, so you're cutting back on the water, the roots are getting established and they can take some more time in between the waterings and they're getting used to um, going on their own and being established as mature trees are. So these are for the young recently planted trees, the first month, three times a week, second month, two times a week, third month, once a week. And then after the first three months, you can, you can uh, just water once or two times, one or two times a month during uh, the hotter months and then during the winter, just once a month. So if you're, like I'm saying, less, probably less than the five gallons per inch uh, during the summer, maybe four gallons per diameter, uh, two gallons of, of water for inch of diameter during the winter. But you could, in a bucket, just see how long it takes you to fill up a bucket of, of whatever number of gallons. If you have a five gallon bucket, you see how long it takes you to, with your hose to, to squirt in that much five gallons, fill the bucket. So you, now you know, well, I'm getting in, a, in two minutes, I'm watering five gallons. So then you can calculate how much you should be watering the trees. Uh, the, you water out at the drip line where the roots are growing and you have those absorption roots. Not squirting the trunk of the tree. So mature trees are established. Um, they don't need much, but during drought, we could be watering, but again, out at the drip line from mature trees. And it's better to not be spraying the trunk with a, a sprinkler and the drip, the, the hoses that have the holes in them around, you can use those or it'd be better than the sprinklers. And like I mentioned, if you have grass around and you're keeping the grass green, that's more water than the trees need. So the trees would be better with watering uh, mature trees a few times, like once or twice a month during a serious drought, but usually they're okay and their, their roots are established and are okay waiting for the rain. Um, the young trees with that three, one, two, three, three, two, one watering system. And it takes a while to water, so you're getting, I mean, it, it, you're master gardener, so you see in a, with flowers or, or vegetables, you spray the water briefly and you dig down with your hand and you can see it, it hasn't got even an inch deep. So it takes a while to get the water to soak in. That's where you'd have an idea with those five gallons or, or four gallons per inch of diameter, how much water you're gonna be spraying. Okay, now, um, chat, no other questions. Uh, we'll look at some other ways to take good care of your trees. So yeah, with um, like you had the mulch circle around the tree and you avoid like lawnmowers, weed eaters getting close to the trees. Um, that's some of the major damage. Uh, I got a video not with, um, but you can see damage here from weed eaters, just how quickly they can damage. So if you put on some protection or just have a mulch circle around so you don't have to get close with the weed eaters. But this isn't of a tree, this weed eater video is real short, but just to see how fast on this, uh, 
how fast the weed eater can damage and then you cut through that bark and you can girdle the tree. So don't do that too. Careful with the weed eaters and the lawnmowers. One, another thing just to mention with some tree biology is there's uh, openings on leaves called stomata and they, they can open and close. There's guard cells that can open or close those uh, stomata. And that's where <coughs> uh, CO2 is taken in and also water is let out. To bring up water from the roots it has to be a continuous stream where the water and nutrients are brought up through the roots and then the water is released through the, the transferation of the water through the stomata. So the stomata have to be open, bringing up water and nutrients and to bring in CO2 for photosynthesis. During a drought, the trees would close the stomata, but they're not gonna be able to be carrying on photosynthesis. So during a drought, you don't wanna fertilize. I mean, think about it a second. Fertilizing is gonna stimulate growth and the trees in stress, stomatas are closed. So that's not when you wanna fertilize and stimulate growth during a drought. Pruning is stress on the tree, all the leaves that it has when it can open the stomata and, and carry on photosynthesis. So you don't wanna prune away leaf area. It needs all that leaf area to produce when it can carry on photosynthesis during a drought. Um, so don't prune during a drought. And then like, it wouldn't be the best time to be doing any trenching, putting in an irrigation system that damages the roots. So before we get into some more tree biology, um, I prepared for uh, the part of the Texas a Forest Service has the, the fire, the wildfire uh, prevention and, and, and fighting wildfires. So those people aren't the tree people. So we had some, I pre presented some information for them and then they had to even take a quiz. So here's some of the quiz questions that those fire guys had to answer. And I guess you guys are interns for master gardeners. So if anyone can turn off or type in the chat um, for the first question, um, we should always have a good reason to prune. Which of the following is not one of the three good reasons to prune? Anyone want to turn on their mic and say what isn't a good reason to prune? C. Which one? See. Yeah, See. You, you do it for aesthetic safety or health, the tree's health, uh, not just like trying to improve the See. value of the tree. C, right. And for two, uh, the maximum recommended amount of leaf area, the crown, the leaf area, the pie uh, that should be removed at any one pruning event would be how much? 15, See. 25, 35? 25, B. Yeah, you don't want to do more than 25%. Otherwise, you just split it up and, and do that more next year. So once a year, up to 25%. Hopefully, you don't have to do that repeatedly. Then that live crown area was the vertical part. So the minimum amount of live crown area that you want to leave, how much live crown area you want to have at least what percentage of live crown area? 60. 30, 40, right, D. the 60 it was, D. Um, pruning small branches is less stress on a tree than pruning large branches. What was our general rule for uh, the size of branches? Four inches in diameter. Four inches. Yeah. And the three cut method is designed to C. C. 
Prevent, Prevent tearing. tearing or ripping bark from the trunk. And ripping. With, the, with the shape of branch unions, you want what shape? U. D. D, U, D. D, U. Okay, so, yeah, Vince, uh, they all pass. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll split that uh, this PowerPoint presentation into three parts so that Vince will be able to send it to you all by email. That'll I'll send it to him later tonight, um, and then he'll send out the email, and then these uh, resources will be in that document, the PDF with this presentation. But there's um, then that I mentioned earlier with the uh, restoring trees after hurricane where you might have to do some topping because you have broken main leaders and you have to establish a new leader on the tree. You don't want to just top and leave it. You want to have, you're going to be picking a, a, a secondary branch that you want to become the new leader if you have to top a tree after a storm. So there's information on that. A lot of is uh, from uh, Professor Ed Gilman in uh, University of Florida. He comes over to Texas pretty often and does some great presentations. Um, yeah, uh, these, <clears throat> these are available for free. There's uh, an excellent book, but this is $85 through uh, in, uh, the ISA organization. So that's a bit more expensive, but Everything is in here. Um, it's an excellent book. And then they can get the, the safety, the ANSI uh, pruning instructions, but that also has a cost. There's a lot available online now. Um, and in one of the handouts that I sent, not, not within the PDF for this presentation, but separate, um, there's a, a one page list of internet links. And one of them in there, if you do on Google, just tree plant, Texas tree planting. You type in Google Texas tree planting, you'll get an excellent website from Texas A&M University that it's actually from our forest service. Um, and and uh, and there's a lot of information online on how to plant trees, how to take care of the trees. Okay. Um, palm trees we have in the coastal bend. Are palm trees trees? So they're actually more closely related to grasses than trees. Um, they don't have you know, inside, it's not the wood, it's the fiber. And so they don't put on that annual growth with uh, like uh, growth rings in, in woody trees. And they're not trees, they're palm trees is the name. I guess they should be called palm grasses. And they don't repair or seal over wounds with that coated. Uh, remember, coated was a compartmentalization of disease or decay in trees. So palms don't don't do that. So when you, you like, it used to be climbing trees with um, spikes, spurs, and that's not done now with trees unless you're going to be cutting the tree down. Uh, it's used climbing with ropes or bucket trucks not with, with spurs anymore. Um, and that would be a equally bad on palm trees, even worse, because they won't seal over those wounds. So the palms that we saw after that February frost uh, looked real bad. It's pretty good with the number that I've been able to come back. The queens are hit pretty hard, but they only have that one bud, the one meristem, and if that's lost, then you don't, it's not like you get branching or like you saw some trees uh, re-sprout from the trunk 
uh, months after the February freeze. And so the trees can activate secondary buds and palms don't have those. They only have that one bud at, at the, the main meristem at the top. So if that's dead, the palm's gone. <clears throat> yeah, so the, the root system grows different and they're not trees. And then um, I don't usually recommend fertilizing a young planted tree, but with palms, there is a lot uh, more reasons to fertilize when you plant palms. They're a lot different than the trees. And you plant them during the grow growing season, not like October, November, December, January is the best time to plant trees during the, for the palms you would plant during the growing season. Okay, right at the very beginning, I mentioned uh, one of the other things that we'll look at briefly is a national initiative program going on called Healthy Trees, Healthy Lives. Because I think, you know, a lot of us, well, too often I think people take for granted uh, trees, but all the benefits that trees bring to us um, with increasing the value of our home. But now there's even a lot more research with the trees improve our health. Just being outside in nature, around trees, outside walking around, hiking, exercising, um, has a lot of benefits for our health. So you know, walking, jogging, hiking improves your health. Being around trees releases or relaxes your mind and, and lowers your blood pressure. Um, being in nature helps your body's immune system function better and boosts disease-fighting cells. This is all proven research, so um, it's available online. And tree shade reduces temperatures up to 20 degrees, just makes it nicer, especially in our South Texas summers, right? You want to be in that shade of the trees when you're outside. And we all know that trees produce the oxygen through the photosynthesis and they filter the air particles and that's better for our lungs and our respiration. And trees encourage outdoor activities and healthier lifestyles. Um, play in nature improves school learning and performance. That's also proven research with kids that spend more time outside in nature around trees have better grades at school. Okay, don't see anything on the chat. Got to, and we're gonna keep going, right? Just keep going straight through. Yes, nod your heads, looks good. Okay, I got a, a video that I really like um, just to make us think a little bit about um, the tree growth and what's going on, so. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this video first is, is uh, with uh, Healthy Trees, Healthy Lives. This is an actual video produced in Conroe, just north of Houston. Um, there's a health clinic and the doctor there is, uh, produced this video with Texas a and Forest Service, someone I work with. Um, and it's just really uh, uh, the importance of, he's recognizing the importance of people getting outside and, and spending time in nature. Oh. Dr. Daniel Porter from Lone Star Family Health Center. We're a federally qualified health center out of- oh, man. I think the timing is now messing up these videos also. So. Dr. Daniel Porter from Lone Star Family Health Center. We're a federally qualified health center out of Conroe, Texas. 
we serve 90,000 patient visits a year, and I try to write a prescription for nature instead of a prescription for drug. We have a printout that comes out of our electronic health software, and choices for them in terms of local things that they can go explore, and then we try to get them to commit. Even if it's just once a week, please go spend an hour outside. A lot of mental health issues we care for out of this clinic too. Depression, anxiety. As a primary care doctor, you start wondering what else can I offer my patient um, rather than just giving them the next pill. To create the first Nature Explore classroom at an FQHC in the entire country. So that's one aspect is the prescriptions. The other is that we try to do a walk with a doc program once a week. So we encourage our patients to join us at the local park. We're walking with a doc and we start with a 10 minute presentation on a health topic and then walk for about an hour. And you're walking with your doc. More and more data is showing that when we have access to natural space, when people spend more time outside, we get reductions in those diseases and, and we, they get treated better. As the science progresses, that's what I buy into. That's what I'm bred to do is to listen to science and, and I want the proof and I want evidence that it's working. So as a primary care physician, I'm trying to take care of the whole patient and the whole family for that sake. And that boosts the health of that patient and boosts the health of our community. So yeah, I just, that's really good. I mean, if we can get working with uh, medical clinics and just the importance of people spending more time in nature, your master gardeners and, and the time outside, with your gardening is also good for your health, not just your stomachs for producing vegetables. I mean, but it's also good for your health. Everyone knows the state tree of Texas? The country. The country. Right. Okay, and then we'll we got some extra time from, so I added on some to this presentation to get in a little bit more with tree biology. Um, Cause what time do we have till 8.30, I think? All right, so I don't think we'll go completely to 8.30, but a few more minutes. So with um, healthy trees, healthy lives, I sent a more complete handout by email to Vince. He'll be sending uh, the Healthy Trees, Healthy Lives handout to you by email. Uh, some information on other tree benefits with, like I mentioned adding value to your home and land, but also just improving air quality. Uh, a lot of cities are realizing with more trees planted, it's less stress on their stormwater systems and can reduce uh, the water entering those stormwater systems so they're not overstressed. And, and with <clears throat> energy savings, just I mean, if you got a tree um, putting some shade on during the day, uh, that's saving you hundreds of dollars over the year with uh, lowering your electric bill with the air conditioning we have during the hot South Texas summers. So here's a page that'll come uh, by email with all those internet links. Um, the Texas tree planting is on there. Healthy trees, healthy lives. Um, the Texas a and Forest Service uh, website. And also there's a lot of in here with uh, urban forestry information sheets. You can put that into Google urban forestry information sheets and get from Texas a and Forest Service a lot of information on taking care of trees. And the links are here that you have for watering, tree health, benefits, uh, just how to take care of the trees. So that is a handout that will be coming to you by email from Vince. And then here's with the, the three, two, one, one, two, three, the first month, three times a week, second month, third month. Planting, just keep that trunk flare, not below ground, don't dig too deep. So that's another handout that's coming to you. Don't plant tree too deep.
Did a couple of things with uh, tree biology, if we understand how trees work and function and grow. If we understand the tree biology a bit more, we can take better care of them. Um, and some terms for you all as master gardeners, um, if you've heard of angiosperms and gymnosperms. So angiosperms are flowering plants and then you have gymnosperms like the conifers. Um, they don't have flowers, they have naked seeds like the pine cones. And a long time ago, the only way I could keep straight one is, well, which is regular trees, the broadleaf trees, are they angiosperms or gymnosperms? But they have flowers. So I just remember Rolling Stones with Angie Angie, the Rolling Stones song, and Angie Angie, she you know, probably likes flowers. So angiosperms are the ones with flowers. Have you ever heard of, what's that? Uh, the current and X current, different tree forms like the triangle shape, more common in, in uh, conifers, but also in some broad leaf trees, you can have the X current, but that triangle shape compared to the round crown like live oaks and a lot of other broad leaf, but you can have some broad leaf trees that are X current shape. So it's just two terms in case um, your master gardener leaders, I guess they give you tests and everything, right? So maybe that's some fancy terms in there, the current and next current. And the X current, sort of easy to remember, just with that triangle shape, if you continue those lines up, you'd have an X. So you can remember X current is that triangle shape. Okay, here's the, the other video that I really like just to get us thinking about uh, what's going on in trees. Um, and and the, the whole idea of uh, trees with, with the, the mass in the large trunks and large branches, how is all that formed? You know, it's taking out water nutrients from the roots and there's, what's, how does it, where does all that mass come from? So I hope you enjoy this video. I like it a lot. Trees are some of the biggest organisms on the planet. But where do they get that matter to grow? This nutrient out of the ground. It's that soil, really, yeah. Goodness out of the soil, I suppose. Comes out of the soil. Yeah. Yeah. Goodness. Goodness. Mm. Why isn't there a big hole around the tree where it's taken out all the soil? Because it doesn't say gradually, but the soil has time to recover. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think it's intuitive to believe that the tree gets most of its mass from the soil, because you can see those roots digging into the soil, and they must be taking something out of there. And I mean, a tree looks like dirt, and it feels solid like dirt, but it's not. In the early 1600s, a scientist named Johann Baptiste van Helmholt tried to figure out where the mass of a tree was coming from. So he got a pot of soil and very carefully measured the amount of soil in there. Then he planted the tree and took care of it for five years, making sure that no soil left or was added to his pot. And at the end of this experiment, he weighed the tree to find that it was 72 kilograms, but the mass of soil had only decreased by about 60 grams. This was pretty strong evidence that the mass of the tree does not come from the soil. I've never thought about that, actually, because they don't really eat anything. Trees. They, they don't eat me. No, no. They don't eat anything. Water is all they absorb. That's all they eat? Yeah. They don't eat anything else? No. That's all they eat? Well, presumably from the water and the nutrients from the soil. Is there anything else that you need besides the soil and the water? I suppose that's what you need, isn't it? To make uh, other, other than the original seed. For, for that particular tree. The seed and the soil and the water and that mm. makes this big tree. Mm. Of course, Johann Baptiste van Hemholt did conclude that the tree was made entirely of water. Now, while that's not correct, at least he was on the right track, realizing that the matter of a tree doesn't come out of the soil. The sun energy, yeah. 
the sun energy. Yeah. Are they converting energy into mass, or do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't like know. Like there, there wasn't there wasn't stuff, and then there was. Like where did that stuff come from? Magic. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. My question is, where do they get that mass to grow big? Sun. It's from the rain and the sun, presumably. Light. The sunlight. And the sunshine. The sunshine. Does it does the sunshine add mass to the tree? Um. Well, it, yes, it wouldn't. They wouldn't grow without it. I don't know whether it adds mass, but they wouldn't grow without it. Of course, the sun's energy is needed for the tree to build the matter into its branches and leaves. But the sun itself, the energy, is not matter. Well, I suppose we've got to put air into this as well. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there's got to be something out of the, uh, you know, what is it a, about gas, the air? a gas in the air that it needs as well. Oxygen. The trees need the oxygen. Yeah, they need the oxygen, don't they? And uh, I guess oxygen. The oxygen, of course. The oxygen? Are there any ingredients that we're missing? Um, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. So would it together. surprise you to find out that 95% of a tree is actually carbon from carbon dioxide? That trees much, are largely yeah. made up of air. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, I, need, I, need, I need this reaction. Like, oh, holy oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so as it turns out, trees are mostly made out of air, out of the carbon dioxide that they take in. And what's interesting is that we breathe out carbon dioxide and water. That's how we lose mass. But it's the exact same substances that trees breathe in to gain mass. So if you can imagine a closed system where it was just you and a tree, you would breathe out that carbon dioxide and water, the tree would take it in, so you would get smaller while the tree is getting bigger. And in a sense, you're becoming the tree. So yeah, um, so the trees release the oxygen in photosynthesis. So the important part is the carbon dioxide going in through those stomata and the leaves and it's carbon-based life. So. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the carbon through photosynthesis is converted into the carbohydrates and that's where the tree gets the energy to grow and also stores it in the woody areas, puts on their woody growth each year. And that's where the mass of the tree comes from, the carbon. Um, let's see, the... There's something about a Royal Ponciana, the flamboyant tree, right? The Royal Ponciana, flamboyant. What's the question about that? Um, oh, the, yeah, that I actually, I put a Ponciana in my yard. They're growing down in the valley. I tried it here in Kingsville, uh, real, uh, real susceptible to freeze. Um, Mine took probably four months to show any trunk sprouting after the two-year-old Royal Ponciana that I had in my yard. Now it's sprouting from the trunk. But when you get those sprouts from the trunk, they're never going to be attached as strong as, as that original trunk growth. So my Royal Ponciana is re-sprouting, but they're tough. You're going to have trouble with freeze uh, trying to grow Royal Ponciana, the flamboyant trees here in Corpus Christi. Um, and I've, yeah, in Central America, they're called Malinche. Um, and those, they're real common in Central America. Uh, and I, I've never been to Hawaii, so I guess they're there. Uh, videos, uh, I'd have to dig in to find the links for the videos. I can try to send that to Vince. Pecan trees, yeah, there's different, the main pecan trees for the uh, stuff. If you have a good pecan tree, you probably got a lot of squirrels too, so. And yeah, so I've never been to Hawaii. I guess there's Royal Poncianas in Pearl Harbor. I don't know about that. Okay, so with photosynthesis, you have that carbon dioxide taken in. Um, through the stomata, the stomata have to be open for that that 
release of of water that bring up that continuous tube of water to move all that water up you can imagine what size pumps you would need so the way that trees can do it through that continuous stream of water from the roots and nutrients taken up up through the the tubular system vascular system in the trees and then released through the stomata as carbon dioxide is taken in but that has to be a continuous stream of water or you can't the trees can't move up, can't move the water up through the vascular system. So the photosynthesis uh, reaction is pretty amazing. And that produces the sugars, the carbohydrates, and then releases the oxygen. And, and actually, they call it respiration, not like our breathing respiration with lungs, but in trees and plants, uh, respiration is, is the use of that stored energy, the carbohydrates. And it's the exact opposite reaction as photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is the reaction on the top of the screen. And then on the bottom is re respiration, which is the exact reverse of the photosynthesis reaction. And that's where the energy is released for growth. One other thing to mention as we finish up, uh, if you've heard of mycorrhizae, a fungus, a beneficial fungus in roots, in, in almost all plants, 90, 95% of all plants, not just trees, but it's a, a symbiotic relationship between the fungus and, and the absorption roots um, in plants. Mycorrhizal fungi play key roles in the nutrition of plants. This is critical when it comes to tightly bound soil nutrients, such as phosphorus. As non-mycorrhizal roots grow into the soil, most of the phosphorus is unavailable. Compare this to mycorrhizal colonized roots. Here, tiny mycorrhizal filaments called hyphae explore significantly greater volumes of soil resource and excrete powerful enzymes then unlock phosphorus from soil surfaces and act as a conduit directly back to the plant. The result is improved phosphorus uptake and nutrition. So the point is, if you haven't heard of mycorrhizae fungus with the benefits with roots and for all plants, um, I mean, it's, it's super important and it increases their ability to absorb water, absorb nutrients so much that all that carbohydrates, sugars produced from photosynthesis, the plants will give over half of that to the fungus, feed the fungus, because the fungus helps so much with taking up more water and nutrients. So mycorrhizae is really important, a good, term for you to know and know that that fungus is a good relationship in the roots. And then it's naturally occurring in soils. Uh, you can buy inoculants and mycorrhizae, but sometimes they're inactive. I'd rather just from an area with a, a plant species that's growing well, take some of that soil and put it into a, the soil, work it into the soil where a plant's having trouble. <clears throat> Okay, just a couple more terms and then we'll finish. Uh, geotropism, where, where plants respond to gravity and phototropism, like if you have near a, a window, the, the plants lean towards the sun or the light, and that's called phototropism. Just some more terms maybe put on your tests as master gardeners. That's it. So any questions? <clears throat>